Hi, Year 12. This is Lesson 1 on the UK Core Executive. The point of this slide is to show you how we're working. So this week's seminars are going to be in the House of Lords, which you were working on last week. And as you can see, the, the lessons that we're going to have this week, the pre-recorded uh, lessons and the preparation, are all focused on next week's seminar, which will be about the UK Cabinet and different examples of events that have occurred there. Okay, so what do we need to know? Well, the specification for looking at the executive is to focus primarily on the Prime Minister and Cabinet, how policy is made, the way in which the Cabinet works, and the way in which the Prime Minister has perhaps grown in power, but also questions about accountability and how the government is actually held to account by Parliament, stuff we've already done to an extent, but which we're returning to. As far as this lesson is concerned, we're introducing the question of what is the Cabinet? What's the purpose of it? Who's in it and how do they get there? There are some key resources which you'll find in your notebook, the one by McGee and Garnett talking about is cabinet government dead, but also by Bannister from 2017, asking if collective cabinet responsibility is still there. Our aim is to be able to answer these assessment questions. As you can see there, they're focused on the relevance of cabinet in modern government, but also whether or not cabinet collective responsibility is still important. OK, so what is Cabinet? Well, the Cabinet is constitutionally at the centre, the chief executive body of the government, where major decisions are made. What's interesting is it's chaired by the Prime Minister, who's known as first among equals. And when you consider that, it's because the Prime Minister has the control of royal prerogative powers, but at the same time is expected to make decisions with their Cabinet. Unlike the United States, where the President is chief executive solely, the Prime Minister works with their Cabinet, and that is based around the Convention of Collective Cabinet Responsibility. That, con that convention means that everybody in Cabinet must agree to the decisions that are being made. And if they don't, and they don't abide by that position, they must resign from office. There's a ministerial code, which is written by every Prime Minister about what's expected of how the Minister should behave. This has been shown recently over the controversial nature of Patel's petition, uh, continuing position in the Home Office. So that's what the Cabinet is. The question has to be how relevant is Cabinet in modern government? Now, this diagram shows you how government is organised in the UK. You can see the Cabinet and the Prime Minister at the centre of the UK executive. The Prime Minister, first among equals, choosing their cabinet um, to run the different individual departments. And if you look at the bottom there, you can see how individual departments will run particular areas of the government. So if it was Williamson, he would have his civil service and his special advisors, and he would be questioned by the Select Committee on Education. He will attend the cabinet. But as you can notice from the core executive diagram at the top, the Prime Minister has a number of different ways in which he can make decisions. He may choose to make bilateral meetings, which means he has one-on-one -on -one meetings with individual department ministers. Or he may choose to use cabinet committees, which are smaller groups of the cabinet, to discuss specific areas of policy. So, for example, it might be that there's the, in terms of home affairs or foreign affairs, there are specific cabinet committees for that. It really depends on the prime minister's style and how they want to develop things about how they would use cabinet committees. There's also the Cabinet Office, which includes the Cabinet Secretary, who oversees the whole of the civil service. This could be really seen as the centre of, of government because the, the actions and the agenda and the minutes of the Cabinet are, re are resolved within the Cabinet Office. But sometimes you put significant ministers in there to coordinate government policy across departments. And finally, you can see that the Prime Minister's department, where he may find his special advisors there to support him. This, of course, has been best known in over, over recent years to be the place where Dominic Cummings would exist. To develop this further, there's a slide is, which basically explains a little bit more about each of the key components of the core executive. So if you're answering a, an explain and analyze question, these may be the three that you would choose. Bilateral meetings, a great example of that being the decision by Blair and Gordon Bryan in 1997 to make the Bank of England independent over interest rates without discussing with the full cabinet. Cabinet com committees, as mentioned before, and the fact that there are different 
cabinet committees for different prime ministers. Brian using the National Economic Council because of the economic crisis he faced, or May using it for Brexit. And finally, then we have the cabinet office with its core functions of supporting the prime minister and the cabinet and coordinating collective policy. What's interesting about the present cabinet office is the role of Michael Gove. You can see the people involved in the cabinet office now, but Gove sits there as a minister for the cabinet office with no specific department. What he does is he oversees collective decisions. So in that sense, he's, been, he's had roles in terms of Brexit and increasingly roles over in terms of COVID. Other people involved in this, as you can see, are constitutional issues, but also defence. And right at the bottom there, it shows you the, civil, the senior civil servants who are involved in the cabinet office. And this is really where the coordination of government lies and does imply that Gove has a significant amount of power over the running of the government. Now, what I'd like you to do is consider the additional articles that I've, I've linked in here and add any additional notes that you have about cabinet committees and on the cabinet office into your OneNote page. And if you can do that for Sunday, that would be superb. All right, now this is uh, Boris Johnson's present cabinet. And the setting out of it this way shows you some of the important offices that exist within the government. You have Sunak as Chancellor of the Exchequer, Patel as Home Secretary, and Raab as Foreign Secretary, seen as the three main uh, offices of state to support the Prime Minister. Gove, however, sits there as Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster or Minister for the Cabinet Office, and he also is at the centre of government. Then you consider some of the other important departments that exist. Obviously, the big spenders, you've got Matt Hancock at Health and you've got Williamson at Education. If you look around the other ones, you can see other areas that may be restricted more recently, such as International Trade Secretary Liz Truss. Ben Wallace would also be another person as Defence Secretary who'd be a large spender in terms of how the government uh, decides where the money goes. So this begs a question about how relevant the cabinet is as a whole in terms of decision making or whether some ministers are more important than others. And that will certainly depend on the issue. Grant Shapps, for example, may raise his importance in regards to Brexit and the actual logistical situation that's going on there. So there may be times when some ministers become more relevant than others. What's interesting, too, is to see changes over time. So if we went back to before this uh, most recent reshuffle, you can see the different people who would have been involved in Boris Johnson's cabinet and perhaps the lack of continuity that can exist at times between different offices when ministers are moved, when in fact they only really have, on average, uh, maybe one and a half, two years in any particular post. This is reflected most obviously by looking at Theresa May's cabinet when she originally had her cabinet with Boris Johnson as foreign secretary and then the reshuffle that occurred in Johnson when Johnson decided to leave and you can see the changes that occurred there. Notice uh, in Therese, Theresa May's cabinet, Gavin Williamson as defence secretary. So what I would like you to do is this, I want you to consider the four cabinets I've shown you and find through search, the people who have served in both May and Johnson, who you think has gained a more important job over time, therefore moving up the ladder? And are there any cabinet jobs when you look at them, you think, well, I don't even know what that means. Secondly, I want you to consider this. How does this, how does the big makeup of the cabinet show the priorities in how cabinet ministers are given jobs? And secondly, think about the consistency that can exist, therefore, in government leadership. To do this, what I'd like you to do is make those notes in this page in OneNote. All the resources are there for you, all the different factors and people. And what I would like you to do is see how well you can answer these particular questions in preparation for our seminar. Good luck.